my leg was about three times bigger than my left leg. They just said that he would grow out of it. The leg just kept getting bigger and bigger. I only realized just how serious this was. I would get these blisters, bigger than quarters. She was just skin and bones. I remember saying, our mother is dying. Next, two medical mysteries that defy the experts. Adrian Martinez loves playing football more than anything. But that all changes when his leg begins growing in a way he could never have imagined. But nobody really knew what was wrong with him. They couldn't stand being alive anymore. Wouldn't anyone help my son? Then, Kathy McFadden's seemingly ordinary life turns into a living nightmare when no doctor can explain the terrifying series of symptoms which plague her for more than 10 years. I knew something very serious was happening. My greatest fear was that I could die. In the summer of 2005, Maricela Cruz was raising four children in the West Texas town of Socorro. With no man in the family, she felt especially close to her oldest boy, Adrian. At that time, I wasn't working. I had a pretty hard life then. But despite his family's hardships, for 12-year-old Adrian Martinez, it's a carefree time. I had a lot of friends. They lived in my neighborhood. My favorite things to do was to wrap my bike around. Always active and energetic, Adrian appears to be in perfect health. Nothing seems out of the ordinary, except for his large birthmark. It was the whole leg from hip to ankle. It didn't really bother him all that much. The birthmark, it was a little pink. I didn't even notice my leg. Everything was good. But one day that September, as Adrian is getting ready for school, he suddenly experiences a very strange sensation. His right leg is extremely hot. I could feel the heat waves coming out of my leg. The heat was, was pretty, pretty intense. I think I could compare it to an iron. And that's when I took him to the pediatrician. They just said that he would grow out of it. But over the next four months, the bizarre feeling only intensifies. I noticed my leg getting hot all the time. I just thought it was like a freakish thing that was happening to me. And it's not long before Adrian notices something even more disturbing. I was playing football with my friends, and I felt a heaviness in my leg. And it was getting real hard to walk. I noticed that my right leg was a little bit bigger. I was just didn't know what to blame her on. Hoping for the best, Adrian tries to ignore the change in his leg. But over the next month, it seems to grow even larger. I noticed that his leg was getting wider and bigger as he was going through puberty. I really didn't know why it was getting so big. It was about 20% bigger, and it was swollen up all the time. I couldn't ride my bike anymore because my leg was rubbing against the frame of the bike. His leg was actually growing so fast. I just knew something was terribly wrong with my son. Alarmed, Maricela brings Adrian into the local clinic. His pediatrician really didn't have any knowledge of this problem. He just recommended that I just leave it alone. I was not satisfied with that response, so I decided to ask a couple other doctors. She takes Adrian from appointment to appointment, but no one can explain why his leg keeps growing. The doctors 
would just run the tests and they never really told me what they were looking for. And then they would say there was nothing wrong with him, that they couldn't find anything. At this point, I was seeing the doctor at least once a month. My right leg was about 35, 40% bigger. I was getting really frustrated and mad at the doctors because I thought that they should know everything and that they should know what was happening to me. But nobody really knew what was wrong with him. I just wanted some answers. Wouldn't anyone help my son? The leg just kept getting bigger and bigger. In eighth grade, I was getting depressed about the size of my leg. I realized that people were looking at me. They were laughing. It was something that, you know, nobody has ever seen. He could not hide this problem at all. Even if he wore baggy pants, it was very noticeable. It was getting real hard to walk. And after a while, my ankle started hurting. I feel like a sharp pain, like someone was hitting me with a hammer. Frightened by his painful new symptoms, Maricela takes him to the hospital. They did all kinds of studies to see if they can find something wrong with his leg. They're doing x-rays to see what was around inside my leg. They were checking the radius around my leg. They're doing MRIs and CAT scans. And I was worried that I had cancer or disease that could kill me in six months. My biggest fears about the doctors running these tests were for them to tell me he might pass away. Over the next three weeks, Adrian and his mother wait anxiously. And finally, the results are in. The doctors told me that I had elephantiasis. Elephantiasis is an extremely rare disorder of the lymphatic system, which causes tissue in the lower half of the body to dramatically thicken and swell. The condition is not well understood, and there is no known effective treatment. I was shocked. They told me that there was nothing that could be done, that we had to wait till he got older and see what would develop from there. I was just wishing for it to just stop growing. It made me feel kind of sad that that would never happen. Horrified, Adrian returns home and tries to manage his condition the best he can. But his leg continues growing. By his sophomore year, it's two and a half feet in diameter and weighs 100 pounds. I could barely even walk from class to class. Adrian would have to leave like 10 minutes earlier to get from one side of the school to the next. When they let me out of class early, I wasn't walking fast enough. So when I was going up the stairs, I got caught between everybody that was trying to go up and down the stairs. Somehow, Adrian gets through the school year. But the leg persistently balloons up. When I was a junior, my leg was about three times bigger than my left leg. It was about 56 inches around. Yeah, I was scared. I just didn't know what was happening to me. Over the past three and a half years, 15-year-old Adrian Martinez has watched in horror as his right leg has grown in a way no one could have ever imagined. By his junior year, it's a grotesque 56 inches around and weighs nearly 150 pounds. Just when he thinks it can't get any worse, a shocking new symptom begins to emerge. I started getting little pimples on the right side of my leg. They were full of white pus. When the pimples would pop, it had a very false smell to it. I took Adrian to the dermatologist he didn't say what was wrong with the skin. He mentioned that this was the biggest leg he has ever seen. He actually didn't know why the leg is bigger than the other. The dermatologist told Adrian to do his best to keep his leg clean uh, just by showering. At a dead end, Adrian watches the disturbing pimples multiply 
while his days in school turn into a nightmare. I felt really scared all the time if they would pop in the middle of class. And whenever I smelled it, I just thought that everybody else was smelling, they will just stare at me. So I couldn't stand being alive anymore. Then, just when Adrian feels like he's hit rock bottom, a teacher at his school takes him under his wing. The first time I met Adrian, I made it a point to find out more about him and talk to him about what he was going through. He was a bit frustrated in regards to that the doctors really didn't know what to do, what it was. I realized that uh, not only was Adrian really, really special, but he really needed a lot of help. We live in a community where there's not a lot of resources. I wanted to try to get him to the specialist, and maybe there's some type of medication, maybe some type of therapy that will help him uh, have a normal leg. Adrian and I started searching the internet. It felt really good that a person that was first a stranger would be like one of my best friends. As we started to research this elephantiasis, we realized that some of the symptoms uh, didn't quite match up with everything that he was going through. Sure, he's on to something. Luis redoubles his efforts, and two weeks into his search, he comes across a disease that seems to match Adrian's symptoms to a T. I talked to some of the experts about Adrian's condition, and they were able to point us in the right direction to get the best help available for Adrian. Two weeks later, Dr. Robert Rosen, a New York endovascular surgeon, agrees to look at Adrian's file. What stood out to me when I reviewed this patient's history was the degree of enlargement of this limb. In the years that I've been practicing, uh, I've seen a handful of patients that had this degree of involvement of uh, one extremity. After reviewing Adrian's medical records, it was clear to me that Adrian was suffering from klippel trenone syndrome, or KTS. klippel trenone syndrome, or KTS, is a rare congenital abnormality that generally involves one arm or leg. In a healthy individual, a complex system of arteries, veins, and lymph channels develop in a fetus to carry blood and lymph fluid throughout the body. But in patients like Adrian, for some unknown reason, these vessels fail to form properly. As a result, two things happen. First, deoxygenated blood or lymph fluid collect in the affected limb, causing swelling. Then, tissue overgrowth and skin abnormalities may develop, resulting in deformity. KTS, which stands for klippel trenone syndrome, is a malformation of the blood vessels and abnormality of the lymphatic system. And it usually involves one limb, usually a leg, during the course of blood and lymphatic vessel development, which is a very complex process. And the embryo and the fetus, all of these primitive vascular spaces that are there at the beginning, which normally refine themselves into arteries and capillaries and veins, somehow get disordered. They're called cavernous venous malformations. They grow with the individual. And there are some situations where hormonal changes can cause the malformation to become much more active, typically at puberty. The tissue overgrowth is not completely understood. Part of it is either blood or tissue fluid accumulating the limb, just making it larger. And then there also tends to be an actual overgrowth of the tissues in the extremity. I realized just how serious this was. As we researched more and uh, found out more about it, we came to the painful realization that it could be a great danger. I was really scared. I would probably die. Sixteen-year-old Adrian Martinez has just learned that he has KTS, a rare disorder which has caused his leg to grow horrifyingly large. But to Adrian's shock, his birthmark, which no one thought important, was in fact the first sign of the disease. Classically, KTS involves kind of a reddish purple birthmark. The reason these birthmarks are sometimes warm to the touch is that the blood is obviously warm. Most likely as he grew, the blood flow became higher to the surface of the skin, and the closer the blood is flowing to the surface, the warmer it will feel to the touch. Even more surprising, Dr. Rosen suspects that Adrian's right leg was always bigger. 
but it wasn't noticeable until puberty sped everything up. In the average case of KT syndrome, the abnormal tissues in the leg will grow along with the rest of the body. And these are fairly subtle at birth and may become more apparent as the child grows. And generally, when growth stops in late adolescence, early adulthood, um, the malformation will stop growing. And while Adrian struggled to live with the incredible transformation, the next symptom to surface, the pimples on his leg, added to his distress. Fluid pressure in the tissues is so great that it just infiltrates out to the skin surface, forms these little blister-like areas. Undoubtedly, the uh, tissue fluid, in his case, was probably infected, and probably why he had recurrent inflammation. As in any infection, an odor can develop related to that. The most serious aspect of these soft tissue infections is that they can spread very rapidly and they can cause instability of the blood pressure and can be life-threatening. I'm really glad that, you know, they were able to tell me in time. But her relief turns to fear when she learns that nothing can be done to prevent a life-threatening infection. The lymphatic malformation, when it's abnormal, there's no direct way to correct it. It's such a tiny network of small, almost microscopic vessels that you can't reconstruct them or rebuild them in any way. This patient's history was uh, really the extreme end of the spectrum of KT syndrome. It's extremely rare to have this degree of uh, limb enlargement. The doctor said that the last thing I could do to have a chance of living a longer life was to get my leg amputated. I felt like the wind just knocked out of me. The risks were very high on the surgery. They told me that he has a 50% chance of dying on the operating table because he had so many veins and that in the process of the operation that he might bleed to death. I was really scared that after everything that I went through that I would just die all of a sudden on the table. My mom, she told me that ultimately it was my choice. I decided to do the operation. I think that he has a real strong character because it's so hard to make this kind of decision, especially at a young age. A lot of conservative measures had been tried, and it was just unmanageable. Living with this on a day-to-day -day basis can be less traumatic to live without the limb than to have a limb that's uh, endlessly causing problems. In October 2009, Adrian is wheeled into surgery at a local hospital. The last thing I said to my mom before they took me into surgery was I told her not to worry about anything, and I told her that I love her. I told them that I loved them and that, it, that everything would be okay. A whole lot of things were going through my mind. Especially, you know, that I would never get to see him alive again. His surgery took 12 hours. When the doctors came out and told me that, um, his surgery was over and done with, and that he had came out very good. There was just a sense of relief. I was uh, kind of concerned. I thought, you know, that Adrian was going to have a hard time adapting to having only one leg. He was worried that, you know, he would never be able to get around, that it was going to be worse than him having that leg. Over the last five years, Adrian Martinez has suffered from a painful, disfiguring disease that left his leg weighing a shocking 150 pounds. Now, he's undergone an amputation and is faced with the extraordinary challenge of making a new life for himself. I didn't really know what to think. I didn't know if I was going to be happier or sad. When I looked down at my leg, I just felt like the whole world was lifted from my shoulders. I felt lighter, and 
I felt happy about the choice that I made. Still, Adrian can't help but wonder why so many other doctors fail to identify the disease. From his records, they estimated that the leg itself weighed up to 150 pounds. Over the past 30 years in my practice, I've seen uh, only a handful of patients with this severity of KTS, and I've probably seen upwards of 1,200 or 1,500 patients with the syndrome. Today, Adrian is 17 years old and about to enter his senior year of high school. This last semester I had straight A's. I hang out with my friends a lot more often than I used to. Since the amputation, Adrian is more social. He feels more comfortable. It's like whatever problem there was is no longer there, and now it's open uh, to just being Adrian. For now, he gets around school in a wheelchair and uses crutches at home. But he's looking forward to using a prosthetic leg one day. I got a prosthetic leg, but the, the muscle in my stump is not strong enough as it would be if I had more bone. I have to go to therapy to learn how to walk with my prosthetic. My hopes for Adrian's future is that he gets up on that leg and he's able to walk on it with no problems. He can get into college and, you know, get a, a good career. I know that Adrian is going to have a great future. He is such a special kid, such a special, special soul. I want to tell Mr. Bettis, thank you for helping me out, even though he didn't really know me, and for being there for me as my friend. If it's possible for me to have a better life. Today I feel really good. Here's this, this kid that went ahead, accepted his condition, made a decision, and now he is moving on with his life. While Adrian Martinez was tormented by an undeniable deformity, a seemingly insignificant symptom turned Kathy McFadden's life into a living hell. In the spring of 1996, 50-year-old Kathy McFadden was on top of the world. She and her husband Bernard were thoroughly enjoying life in their hometown of Wilmington, Delaware. Bernard and I, we were married 26 years. We did a lot of different things together. We lived very close to a park and took a lot of walks. Kathy was just the most vivacious, fun-loving, wonderful mother of our children. With their two daughters grown and out of the house, Kathy is able to focus on her students. I was a guidance counselor. I really did enjoy my job. My mom liked working with families and, and seeing a change, seeing the difference in the kid. But her greatest passion is biking. We would try to bike every weekend. We would do 30, 40, 50, 60 miles a day. It was something that we really enjoyed, really relished. But that fall, after finishing her usual route, Kathy notices an unusual pain in her leg. My ankles were really swollen. You couldn't tell I really had ankles. It just looked like one big leg. That evening, when I went to bed, they were still swollen. I really disregarded it. I thought, by tomorrow morning, it should be fine. And when Kathy wakes up, her ankles are back to normal, and she and Bernard set off on their bikes. But just 20 minutes into the ride, the pain and swelling return. My legs were aching. The pain reminded me of a toothache that isn't like a sharp pain. It's more of a dull pain. So I tried to keep pedaling through it. I was very concerned because she had never had anything like that before. So I knew that 
there was more than just a little problem. I didn't understand this at all. I realized it was time to go to the doctor. I went to my primary care physician, and she had referred me to a vascular surgeon. He felt my ankles, he felt my legs, and he said that probably that this was due to venous insufficiency. Venous insufficiency is a common condition in which blood collects due to faulty valves in the veins and then leaks out into the tissue of the affected area. The swelling was due to the blood pooling around my ankles and that's what was causing the ache in my legs. The doctor recommends that Kathy wear compression stockings to help promote the blood flow in her legs, but it only helps up to a point. When I had to spend a lot of time on my feet, my legs would just ache when I got home. It just got really frustrating when they still hurt. The doctors told her that this was just a natural part of aging. We had plenty of friends our, our own age that weren't having these kinds of problems as a natural part of aging. There weren't any other doctors recommended for me to see. And even though I didn't feel like it was adequate, I didn't know where else to turn. Resigned to her fate, Kathy does the best she can to simply deal with the constant pain and swelling over the next three years. But then, when she least expects it, a strange new symptom begins to emerge in the fall of 2001. One morning after a shower, I noticed I had a rash on my leg. It was an intense itching. I thought maybe it was some sort of an allergic reaction. But it's not long before the bizarre rash takes on a life of its own. I would get these blisters, bigger than quarters, all over the tops of my feet. And the blisters behind my knees was the worst because it really incapacitated me. Whenever I would bend my leg, then that would crack and pus would ooze out. Her legs would seep. Her legs would get very, very swollen. She would be in such pain and discomfort that she could just barely walk. I was shocked by how quickly she was falling apart. I realized that I was sicker than I thought I was. What was wrong with my body? Over the past three years, Kathy McFadden has been suffering from crippling pains in her legs. While her doctors are certain it's a result of poor circulation, she isn't so sure, especially when a frightening rash begins to spread down both legs. I would wake up bloody sheets, oozy sheets, sticky sheets. Legs were a mess. It was horrible. So I made an appointment with a dermatologist. He looked at my legs and he told me I had stasis dermatitis. Stasis dermatitis is a blistering skin condition that develops in areas of the body with insufficient blood flow and fluid buildup. I had medication for the stasis dermatitis. He prescribed a cream for the rash. It just didn't work. I still had to wear the compression stockings. That was really hard. Very often, my legs would bleed and ooze. The stocking then would become stuck to my skin. The dermatologist recommended a complete change of medication. And on my next visit, I hadn't improved. Desperate for relief, Kathy tries one doctor after another, but to no avail. And along with her rash, the agonizing leg pains and swelling continue. She gradually finds herself increasingly debilitated. I started to think to myself, what is going on? My legs were a mess. 
I was really feeling depressed. I was struggling to understand why I should have all these things going wrong. It was uh, difficult for her, especially since she wasn't getting any better. Then, mysteriously, Kathy begins to drop a few pounds. At first, she's pleased, but not for long. I started losing weight rather rapidly. It was small increments, but then it became pretty dramatic. During about a three-year period, Cassie gradually went from being a very robust 150, 155 pounds to maybe 120. And then she went to 115. And she went to 110. And she went to 105, to the point that eventually she, at her lowest point, weighed 95 pounds, and she was just a skeleton. She looked white as a ghost. I mean, she was just skin and bones. I just felt, all of a sudden, very weak. I was tired, too. That's when it became a concern. My primary care did some blood tests. The doctor said that the blood tests that she gave me indicated that I had diabetes. And I asked her what that meant. And she said it was my glucose level that determined that I had diabetes. Your pancreas does not put out sufficient insulin so that your blood sugar level, your glucose, gets too high. The McFaddens are also surprised to hear the doctor say that Kathy's dramatic weight loss is an effect of the disease. I couldn't understand it. I didn't believe that I could have diabetes. Unconvinced, Kathy consults another round of specialists, but the diagnosis remains the same. And gradually, as none of her symptoms improve despite Kathy's best efforts to manage them, the McFaddens begin to suspect that the doctors are missing something important. It appeared to me and to Kathy that these symptoms must in some way be related. They wouldn't make a connection between all the symptoms. And over time, they begin taking an immense toll on her. I felt overwhelmingly fatigued. And at that point, I was taking naps after school. And then also going to bed very early at night. My mom would call out of work to go see a doctor two or three times a week. She realized that she had to retire. And this was an extremely difficult decision for her. On January 1st, 2007, Kathy goes to work for the last time. But it's not a retirement she can enjoy. A lot of my days were spent on the sofa. Bernard took on a lot of extra responsibilities, like the laundry, cooking. She really became much more reclusive. It was difficult for her to get up and walk more than a few steps. I had gotten so thin and so bony that I had to carry a pillow with me when I sat down anywhere because it hurt. My bones were all that was left of me. At this point, I remember my sister saying, you know, our mother is dying. But honestly, I felt like I felt like she'd already died <laughs> because she just wasn't the person that she used to be anymore. For more than a decade, 62-year-old Kathy McFadden has endured a bewildering constellation of symptoms swollen, painful legs, a blistering rash, diabetes, constant fatigue, and severe weight loss. Now, 
After wasting away to a frightening skeletal 95 pounds, she's set on making one last ditch effort to find out what's turned her life upside down. Once again, she's checking in with her general practitioner. I knew something very serious was going on and it frightened me and I didn't know what to do. My greatest fear was that I could die. Having exhausted all other options, the doctor sends Kathy to a local hospital for a full body CAT scan. And when the findings come in, she's completely taken aback. There's a mass the size of a baseball growing in her abdomen. I was shocked. The technician who took the CAT scan thought they saw something on the tail of my pancreas. The medical team isn't sure what the growth is, but the McFadden's fear the worst. This was devastating. So uh, I was very, very, very upset, to say the least. Wasting no time, Bernard and Kathy make an appointment at Thomas Jefferson Hospital with Dr. Eugene Kennedy, a leading pancreatic surgeon. When I met Kathy, I was surprised because she's actually a young and vibrant woman, and she appeared quite old and frail. I thought she was dying. The first thing that stuck out at us was the size of this large mass in the pancreas. It was eight centimeters. Dr. Kennedy said that with a blood test, we'd be able to make a confirmation of just what type of problem this is. We had to wait. It was at least three weeks, and I felt that the wait was interminable. In mid-March, the findings are finally in. Based on the results of the blood test and the CAT scan of her abdomen, we confirmed that Kathy had a glucagonoma. A glucagonoma is an extremely rare tumor that grows on the pancreas. In a healthy individual, the pancreas secretes the hormone glucagon to help maintain blood sugar levels. But in patients like Kathy, for unknown reasons, the tumor constantly secretes glucagon regardless of blood sugar amounts, wreaking havoc on almost every system. The function of glucagon is to raise your blood sugar when you haven't eaten by releasing sugar that's stored in your liver and by breaking down muscle in your body to form sugar. When the pancreas starts to form a hormone-producing tumor, the tumor doesn't pay attention to any of the other signals in the body, so it just grows and makes its hormone without any regulation. I was so relieved. We'd been searching for an answer for 15 years. I really was ecstatic. With each passing year, the tumor set off each and every symptom Kathy experienced. The first signs, her aching legs and swollen ankles, were the result of her body turning the protein in her muscles into sugar. The glucagon causing her to break down the proteins resulted in her lower extremity swelling and aches and pains. If the protein in your bloodstream gets low, you get excess fluid and swelling in your body. And her low protein levels most likely triggered Kathy's next symptom, the horrific rash. One theory is that the breakdown of protein due to the glucagon lowers the level of some of the essential proteins and amino acids that are needed in the body to keep a healthy skin intact. And it was only a matter of time before Kathy's body began to react systemically to the glucagon, triggering her weight loss and diabetes. The glucagon made her body think she was starving. So as a result, she started to break down her own body's muscle tissue to elevate her blood sugar so that her body continued to function. Kathy developed diabetes because the blood sugar was high as if she wasn't making enough insulin. If left untreated, Kathy would have continued to get weaker and weaker, lost weight and become more debilitated. And the more debilitated she became, the more opportunity for other problems, other infections, and other issues of chronic disease to set in. And any of those problems could have uh, resulted in her death. The harsh truth is undeniable. Kathy's life is on the line, and surgery is the only way to stop the disease. There's no cut and dried way to say whether one of these hormone-producing tumors 
is a cancerous tumor that could eventually spread to the liver or if it's a benign tumor that would have not spread anywhere. The worst case scenario I prepared Kathy and her family for was finding spots of tumor that had spread. The treatment would be to examine her abdomen for any signs of tumor, remove anything we could find, and then follow her thereon. Whatever you hear about pancreatic cancer, you always think terminal. I think that this was the first time it truly occurred to me that whatever it was that she had could kill her. So right before they put me under, I told Bernard, I love you, and I'm going to be OK. The wait is excruciating. But four long hours later, Dr. Kennedy finally emerges from the OR. The results of the surgery were great for Kathy. There was no evidence that the tumor had spread anywhere. So we were able to remove the tumor in its entirety. We were just overjoyed. From the time her tumor was removed, she started to get better. There was no additional treatment. And less than a month after the surgery, Dr. Kennedy has more good news for Kathy. Her diabetes had disappeared as well. So every single symptom that she had had was gone. Four years before she was diagnosed, it was very, very disappointing and discouraging that they simply could come up with no leads whatsoever. Bernard and I couldn't help wondering what took so long to find a diagnosis. What's difficult is taking all of these seemingly unrelated symptoms and putting them into a single diagnosis. I've actually never seen someone with a glucagonoma before. They're quite rare tumors. There's several hundred cases reported in the medical literature. However, many of them don't have the severe symptoms that she did. Today, Kathy is back to living the full, active life she once enjoyed. I feel wonderful. I feel fabulous. Every day, I feel stronger. She has more energy now. It's just like a breath of fresh air. I'm just so happy to have my mom back. I'm looking forward to spending a lot of time with my two grandchildren and being able to be with them and watch them grow. It's just so wonderful to have Kathy back. We all refer to her as our miracle girl. I hope I can get her back on her bicycle one of these days. It's something that I think will happen. I feel really better. I can do anything I want. It feels wonderful to be back.